everybody. Good afternoon. Um, let's have some sprites. Um, my name is Ben. Um, I've, I think I've met a lot of you. Um, for those of you I haven't met, uh, I'm one of the DCAs of this tournament. Just graduated from the University of Oxford with a degree that was at least partly in the politics of this place. Um, no, it's not a country. Um, uh, I now study law. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this lecture is going to be partly, I, I'm basically just going to be giving you some facts. I, I think a lot of the time, uh, Africa and the developing world, the third world, want to call it that, which I really, you really shouldn't, um, <laughs> is, is very badly debated about because what people have is a caricature of how it works and to them Africa is the dark continent, it is a black hole of violence and ethnic tension and poverty and brutality and lots of other bad things. Um, what this lecture is I hope going to kind of teach about is how actually a lot of our stereotypes about Africa are incorrect and how we then take a more nuanced and complex understanding of the African continent and apply that in debates. It's not just about debates about Africa per se, as it's not just about kind of motions that are set in a specific country or about a specific policy relating to Africa, but more generally when we do debates about the United Nations, about intervention, about democratization, about aid, often we find ourselves talking about Africa to so the place where a lot of those policies apply the most. And hopefully, many of the general principles that I'll be talking about in this lecture will also apply to other continents that you might also have stereotyped views about, if you do. Um, so the sort of broad format of this lecture is going to be as follows. I'm going to talk about some general guiding principles for debating about Africa. Um, I'm then going to walk you through uh, three specific case studies and the kind of core facts of each, where there's a dispute about each um, and how they played out. Uh, and those case studies are going to be the 1994 Rwandan genocide and subsequent events in the Great Lakes area, um, the Kenyan elections in 2007 and the democratisation process there afterwards, um, and sort of modern day politics in Sudan specifically uh, partition into North and South Sudan and also making some reference to Darfur and interventions there. I'll then talk a little bit about Western policy instruments as they apply to Africa, things like aid and the conditions we impose on aid, um, and then leave time for questions. I should also say uh, I find I teach best and enjoy this most if this is relatively interactive so please do feel free to ask me questions, challenge me on things I'm saying, call me up, ask for more detail. Um, I know the Israelis in the room won't have a problem with that, but you know, for, those of you that, for those of you that aren't Israeli, we're less used to that, please feel free. Yeah, I always find when I teach classrooms full of Israeli debaters, that's really, it's just me talking at them, that's never, <laughs> no one ever talks back, it's a huge problem. Um, so, I've written three things on the board, which to me are the kind of guiding principles we should have when we debate about Africa, when we approach Africa. I think um, a lot of you will know uh, that earlier in the year, there was a video made by an organisation called Invisible Children, called Cody 2012. Uh, and for those of you that, that uh, know me well, I see some wry smiles. Made me pretty angry. Um, it was pretty toxic. I think that's in part because the kind of vision of Africa that we have as this war torn, AIDS ridden monolith um, was really perpetuated by that video. And so the three guiding principles I want to suggest for debating about Africa are these. Firstly, variety. Okay? When I say Africa is not a country, I don't just mean that you shouldn't sometimes accidentally refer to the country of Africa as happens surprisingly often in debates. What I mean is that it's important to recognise that when we apply policies to the African continent, 
we're actually dealing with an incredibly broad spectrum of cases. There are some places with HIV AIDS epidemics, there are some places in the grip of very long civil wars, and there are some places with very deep-seated ethnic tensions. But they're certainly not all like that. And often, only certain regions of particular countries will be like that. Often that will be an exaggeration of the problems uh, faced there. And so that's where this stuff comes in. So, variety. Africa contains many different countries. That, that's trivial. Um, there are 54 members of the African Union. But those countries are very different. They're very different in several dimensions. Firstly, they're very politically different. They range from countries like Ghana and Benin, and to a certain extent Zambia, which are very successful democratic processes, with numerous political parties competing against each other, and elections that would look very much like a, you know, a Western European or an Israeli election. Uh, right down to, yeah. <laughs> and both. They, they, to be sure, have a lot of populism. There's not necessarily a an amazing range of political forces there. But they have serious political dispute. They have free and fair elections. Range from places like that to somewhere like Ethiopia uh, or, or Eritrea uh, or Sudan, a couple of other places, which are still kind of old fashioned quasi military dictatorships. Uh, in the way that lots of people still think about Africa. So Eritrea is sometimes called the North Korea of Africa, because it's still very politically closed. So there's huge amounts of political variety and complexity. And one thing I would say is that you shouldn't, when you're thinking about the, the politics of African democracy, think in terms of either democracy or dictatorship. Like that's some kind of binary thing. Some countries there are still kind of old-fashioned dictatorships, but even those countries probably aren't, don't have kind of military strong men with, you know, dark black sunglasses dressed in full uniform all the time, like in, in the days of old, like Idi Amin or Mobutu. But in between them and the sort of really good democratic performance like Ghana, there's a whole range of different cases. So there's, uh, you know, countries like South Africa, which have free and fair elections, but really only have one meaningfully successful party at the national level, the ANC. Um, there's countries like Kenya, which have t at least two big political forces, um, but elections often lead to violence, elections are often relatively corrupt. There are lots of different ways in which African democracy can go wrong. Um, so you should get out of the habit of thinking of, well, either these places are democratic or, they di or they're dictatorships. Oftentimes, there's a kind of slow process of transition you have to work through from the very worst to the very best. And that's one dimension of uh, variation. Second dimension of variation is economic. So, Africa has like many of the poorest countries in the world. There's no doubt about that. But it also has places like Angola, which are immensely oil rich and have very high and very fast growing GDP. Um, East Africa, so if you're uh, looking at Tanzania at the moment, there have just been big discoveries of natural gas there, they're very natural resource rich. Now, those resources aren't always exploited in the best way, but those countries do have very strong, very wealthy central governments um, that get considerable amounts of revenue. Um, yeah. And you also do have countries like South Africa, which are actually relatively strong economic performance, which have economic growth, and the proceeds of that economic growth are seen by like, large numbers of members of that population. So again, Africa is not just full of poverty. There's a whole range of cases. Some countries are very age dependent. So about 40% of Uganda's national budget comes from aid. Equally, some countries get almost no international aid, particularly oil rich places like Nigeria, like Gabon, like Angola, which just aren't dependent on foreign aid at all. So there's a lot of economic variation. The third type of variation I want to flag up is, is ethnic variation. Now, this is potentially a slightly ugly term, but what I want to try and kind of beat out of people is the habit of thinking of Africa as just a place that's full of tribes, right? Everyone's tribal. Everyone has these deep, historical, primal identities where they just can't help themselves but kill each other. And we all know these words, right? That like we know that, you know, Rwanda has Hutus and Tutsis. We know that... You know, Nigeria has uh, Igbo, Hausa, and 
Shit, this is really embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ebo. That's Ebo. Ebo and Pause Art. Oh god, this is all video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your Rupa. The Ebo, the your Rupa, and the Pause Art. There you go. But those identities aren't necessarily. So, number one, lots of African states don't have ethnic identities at all. There's no, there's no problem with ethnic division. If you're Tanzanian, you probably won't, you may well not even know what your ostensible ethnic identification is. Um, if you're, um, you know, if you're in Ghana, for instance, um, whilst there is ostensibly uh, an Asante ethnic identity for the majority of the population, that won't really be recognised. It's, it's subservient to a national identity. In Senegal, which has seven different notional ethnic groups, most identity is actually constructed around Islam. So, don't necessarily think that all Africans just have these deep kind of ethnic hatreds that they can't overcome. Those things intersect with politics, they intersect with religion, they intersect with economics, and it's important to remember that they don't all look the same. In particular, ethnicity often only becomes important where it is politically useful, right? So a really interesting case study of this is in Zambia, um, you have in, ethnic, in, in urban areas, politics isn't really ethnic. It's based around classical kind of, uh, you know, industrialized democracy, left-right lines, where there's very strong union presence. But then in the countryside, the same political parties will use appeals to member ethnic identity um, to, to get votes. So ethnicity is very complex. Again, don't kind of homogenize all of Africa into one block. Um, why does variety become important in debating? Well, to some extent, all debates are about, or at least all debates about kind of policies that apply to a broad range of countries, like cutting off a certain type of aid, or imposing sanctions on a certain group of people, depend on how well you can deal with the nuance and the differences between all of these cases while still talking about one policy. If you say, if you talk about you know, say cutting off aid to non-democratic states in Africa, as though all of the states we're talking about are Ethiopia and Eritrea. They're all kind of like old-fashioned, quasi-fascist dictatorships. It's very easy for another team to say, well, actually, we think they've not explored the nuance of cases, uh, you know, like Nigeria, where there's one dominant political party, but they allow a large amount of political discourse and there is electoral competition. And, so how well you can then capture variety in your arguments becomes really, really important. Um, the second thing is complexity. I inevitably, this is related to, to what I was saying earlier about variety. But it will rarely be the case that the politics of particular African countries is simple. It will rarely be the case that there are good guys and bad guys. Okay? So hands up if, broadly speaking, you would agree that in Rwanda, based on what you know, uh, the Hutus are the bad guys and the Tutsis are the good guys. If you know anything at all about Rwanda history. Yeah. Okay, nobody, all right. So the Hutus were the ones that perpetrated the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis. Okay? Now, probably most people therefore think that for most of Rwandan history, the Hutus have uncomplicatedly been the bad guys. It's like the Tutsi beforehand were cooperating with uh, a European kind of country to the land, no? This is it, why, like... It, it, exactly. So there's a very good argument to say that potentially there's more complexity in Rwandan history. The Tutsis were in fact started out in a position of much greater political power in Rwanda because they were the ethnic group chosen by the Belgian Empire to run Rwanda for them. Um, and there were events in the 1970s and early 80s which arguably represented Tutsi genocides against the Hutu on a smaller scale than what we saw in 1994, but nonetheless like, were, were bona fide genocides. Uh, in 1996-97, uh, a UN group of experts report has just concluded that the, the then Tutsi government with the RPF, which was the Tutsi army in Rwanda, massacred potentially up to 300,000 ethnic Hutu in the east of Congo. Before or after? But that part of history kind of gets deleted when you create very simple narratives, okay? And it's probably worth noting, therefore, that actually 
Rwanda is not unproblematically about Hutus being bad guys and Tutsis being good guys. Um, similarly, Darfur is often described as a genocide, probably correctly, under international law, but it's important to remember that what we now recognise as the Darfur genocide began largely as a civil war um, between uh, Darfuri nomads and the, the justice and equality movement, which was the kind of militia backed up by the... No, sorry, the justice and equality movement represent ethnic Darfuris and militias on the other side sponsored by the government, mainly the Janjaweed. Okay? So there's a danger of swallowing the kind of simple line that you might read on the front page of a newspaper in African cases, because there's an awful lot of complexity. Now, why is that important? Look, inevitably, giving a seven-minute speech requires you to make the cases simpler. Right? You can't necessarily have all of the historical complexity in a debated speech. But even a fairly small amount of complexity can really help make an argument more persuasive. If you can make a judge believe that you really know what's going on, <clears throat> and the reason for that is that you're actually aware of the complexities of these cases, then that could be massively important. Similarly, defeating kind of broad brushstroke arguments um, that say something like, the Sudanese government has perpetrated a genocide against the Darfuri people who've been totally defenseless, then you can respond to that argument by problematizing it, by saying, well, actually that's not exactly what's happened. Actually, it began as a civil war, and what we may now recognise as a genocide there started out as a civil war between two militias. That might, for instance, complicate whether or not we want to intervene in that context. So, <clears throat> bear in mind that Africa is complex. In particular, don't in debating speeches just like example drop by naming a country and be like, and this will lead to genocide, like in Rwanda. Okay? You laugh. But well, actually, I reckon 85% of the time that examples are used in debating speeches it's without any real description. It's just like assumed that everyone kind of knows what's going on and fails to ever really describe the example or explain why it's relevant. But when examples are complex, they require description. They require you to walk a, walk a judge through a case in a lot more detail. A third guiding principle, agency. So, there's a habit, basically, and this, I think, derives partly from a kind of view of Africans as kind of barbaric or savages, it's obviously very popular in imperial and post-imperial discourse, um, as helpless. Um, and some people, so for instance, in the academia of Africa in the 1970s and 80s, Marxist academics kind of looked at Africa and went, well, Africa's just a victim of the international economic order. There's nothing Africa can do about its situation. Okay? The, the international economic system. You know, the system of trade, the system of aid, who owns property, who owns capital, and so on. So, people often kind of thought, well, Africans are basically helpless, right? This links what I said earlier to things about ethnicity, like often if you think of Africans as barbaric or savage, it's very easy to imagine that ethnic conflict is inevitable, that democracy can never succeed because, you know, it will inevitably just turn to violence because of all these ethnic hatreds that mean people will hate each other. So what we should probably do instead of thinking about that, it's probably unlikely that Africans are that unlike the rest of us, that they're like literally incapable of making choices about their own lives, is think about Africans doing this exercising agency, acting as people just like us in the West, having rational thoughts about how they're going to maximise their well-being, deciding that certain things are valuable to them and following through on those. Yeah? In time agency, I fail to understand the meaning of the word in the current context. Um, so it, it just means basically being able to act as an independent agent. Um, rather than just being a victim of kind of mechanical historical processes that go on behind you. Um, now, why is that important? Firstly, because the number of times I've heard in debates something along the lines of, well, this policy will never work 
because these African governments or these African people aren't rational. And the way we can tell that is that they've done insert X seemingly really stupid thing that kind of screwed them over here. Um, that's an exceptionally bad argument. Um, it's really one of the worst arguments. So on, all the, on, on, the li on a list of bad arguments, I would place that well into my top five. Now, why is that? Well, being rational uh, isn't a matter of, like again, it's not a binary thing, right? Sometimes we all make stupid choices, okay? But it doesn't mean we always make stupid choices. In exactly the same way, the fact that an African dictator has engaged in a civil war that seemingly didn't benefit him doesn't mean that he is irrational in all circumstances and therefore capable of maximising his own good. Now, what's particularly interesting about this is that often in the African context, things seem irrational, right? So hands up if, broadly speaking, you think civil war that leads to huge numbers of deaths is an irrational phenomenon. No one's, no one's taking the bait, this is so unfair. <laughs> I bet you, you all do. Um, but the important point is that oftentimes, actually, uh, civil war will make total sense to the people who are engaging in it. Why? Well, if you are poor, if you start from a position of poverty, you're unemployed, and a civil war offers your rebel group the opportunity to take control of, say, a large diamond mine, and gain the proceeds of being able to sell those diamonds on the international market, going to war might make perfect sense. Indeed. Being incredibly barbaric might make total sense, okay? So, if I said to you, uh, in, in the late 90s in, in Sierra Leone, Fode Sanko's RUF, which was the main rebel group in that country, used to go around villages, um, and often after it took over a village near a diamond mine, it would go into schools, it would set fire, it would like, light a fire around the school, get people to run out, and then force the people that made it out to go back to, force the boys specifically who made it out, to go back home and rape their female relatives. Does anybody think a rational explanation could be given of that? Does they want to try? Yeah, they, they want to recruit these you know, boys to their group, and they want them to feel like, do something so terrible, so so something so wrong, so they can never go back to their family because what they have done. So they have no other choice to to join our the cause of their group. Boom. Exactly. When you, I mean, do you want to add no, something? Just to clarify, that was Sierra Leone. That's the same side with regards to Joseph Kony in Uganda. Yeah. 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 Y
Now, what I'm trying to get across is that this seemingly horrific act that we might have huge difficulties in properly understanding actually has a kind of rational root in the sense that people can explain it with reasons, it kind of makes sense to them. So rediscovering agency, even in contexts where it might look like it's just mad barbarism, is really, really important. Does anybody have any questions about these like general guiding principles before we start talking about some examples? Or sort of more general questions about like things that you find hard about debating about development or Africa, but I can kind of fold in as we go. Oh, a question about a yeah. specific argument? Occasionally, okay, can I give a motion and then? Yeah. It's a long motion. This house will prioritize asylum seekers who will engage in armed struggle against oppressive force. Yeah. Now, I thought about this motion a long time, and why should I prioritize the asylum seekers, asylum seekers who will engage in armed combat? Because they are the ones that fought, because they are the ones that rose against the oppressive force. And that relates to a sentence I used to hear, I once heard. An African problem requires an African solution. That's the, what I want to engage. Mm -hmm. Is there any, what's the rationale behind the sentence an African okay, problem? Okay, a few things. Firstly, oh well, so you want the rationale for an African problem? I want how to attack it and I want to know what is it. Okay, <laughs> so sometimes the phrase is, is thrown about African problems need African solutions. I think that phrase is kind of ugly and not necessarily that helpful. But it probably does get across something important, which is that a lot of the time, Western policymakers, just people in the West, have a kind of mentality that we need to save Africa, right? That basically, if we just spend enough money, we militarily intervene in enough places, if we stop enough wars and impose enough democracy, then Africa will be fine. And that actually, like the big thing that's wrong is that we don't do enough. Now, that's actually probably not true because there's only a certain amount that you can impose. But to some extent, good policy requires Africans to get it right for themselves in a sustainable way. So it requires them to have democratic institutions and pick good policies and so on. I don't think it's always true that an African problem requires an African solution. Like, sometimes it may well be beyond the resources of the African Union or local actors. Sometimes they might need a nudge from outside or whatever. But to a large extent, it's probably a better idea to try and give Africans the tools to solve their own problems rather than trying to solve them for them because they'll probably get it, like get how to do it a lot better. Uh, sorry, you look, are you, you no, look confused? No, I noticed people are raising their right hands. Okay, I uh, guess. Yeah, so, um, I then um, constantly kind of like I can see sometimes of that. Uh, yes, I mean, so everything we've, been, about yeah, everything we've been saying about complexity and variety, and particularly agency, right? Particularly the idea that Africans are capable of kind of acting as independent, sensible agents might explain why you think an African problem needs an African solution. Because we can't just impose the same policy on all African countries and hope it works out for the best. Because, as we discussed, they're not all the same. And there are many people in those countries who are capable of, kind of acting for themselves to find solutions. Yeah, is, is that kind of... Yeah, it helps. Okay. Uh, when I'm trying to build an argument, like I want to say the citizens of a certain country are not likely to do what I believe is the good thing to do. You are basically instructing me not to say they are crazy, they are unrational, but to show that according to the way they perceive rationality, they are unlikely to do what they want to do. Yes, okay. exactly. It's about explaining the reasons why people behave in certain ways, rather than just being like, well, they're irrational. So that's why they would respond to this kind of yeah. So we can say that like in most of the cases of have anything to do with Africa, then we are talking about Western countries uh, aiming to intervene with the situation within Africa. I'm just wondering whether there are other reasons to, to give it the legitimacy um, to act in Africa according to Western uh, policies than, uh, other than like saving Africa. We did it. Um, well, look, number one, you might think that we owe these countries a kind of moral duty 
because to a large extent it was European imperial powers that screwed up Africa. Like, there were plenty of quite stable states that weren't in this terrible state of war in Africa before empire came and we disrupted those. A lot of ethnic hatreds were created by imperial powers and so on. So you might think there's an argument to say we're to blame. Um, you might think it's just a resource-based argument. Like, Africa is relatively poor. It certainly doesn't have the enormous amounts of cash that the West could potentially hurl at the African continent to solve these problems. Um, I mean, apart from that, you just might think that there's a kind of general international responsibility to prevent a genocide or do whatever it is in a particular context. Um, but yeah, I would say those would be the main reasons. Cool. Let's move on to case studies. So, Rwanda. Now, some background history. So Rwanda is governed by the Belgians uh, under empire. The Belgians, with the possible exception of the Portuguese, are like the nastiest empire. Like Britain did some pretty horrific things in Africa. France did some pretty horrific things in Africa. The Belgians, by a distance, take the biscuit. What we now call the Democratic Republic of the Congo was governed by King Leopold, literally as his personal fiefdom. It wasn't even like an imperial colony. He ran it like it was his back garden. He built a palace there, which was a scale replica of Frederick the Great's palace, which he particularly admired, just like in the middle of the jungle, just built this palace. Uh, people were massacred, there were no doctors, there was no teachers. Uh, and anyway, so Rwanda got treated pretty badly. In particular, one of the things that was convenient to the Belgians uh, in Rwanda was to construct a relatively small elite. This was quite a common tactic of Tutsis. Okay? And they were basic, the basic means by which the Belgians governed Rwanda. Okay? And there was some notional physical differences between Tutsis and Hutus. Um, were they the minority at that point, the Tutsis? Yeah, they've all, the Tutsis have all, well, in as much as the identity existed at all before the Belgians came along, they were a minority. There's some like historical dispute as to whether or not until the Belgians construct these identities, they actually mean anything at all. Would you, would you be able to compare it to the situation in Syria where you do have a very, very small minority controlling the majority, or it's not that small? Uh, they, well, today they're about 15% of the population, but that number has certainly fall, obviously fallen post-1994. Um, so it's a, it's a small minority. Yeah. Um, now, the Belgians do a number of things that really strengthen these identities. Okay? So the Tutsis are the governing class. They get all the leading civil service positions. Um, there's a, a kind of a Rwandan, a Banya Rwanda royal house created, populated by Tutsis. Um, in particular, everyone in Rwanda has to carry an identity card under Belgium. And whereas Tutsi and Hutu would certainly have been very loose weave categories of identities before the Belgians came along, and many of many people might consider you could consider yourself like half Tutsi and half Hutu or whatever, the Belgians like picked a side for you. Okay? So you were either Tutsi or Hutu on your identification card. And so those identities get massively strengthened. Um, now, what basically happens, um, in late 70s, uh, the Hutus, well sorry, no, they seized power much earlier, um, in 1961, but after a while, the Hutus take power. What point did Rwanda get carved off from most of its own independence? It was always got it was always Rwanda, yeah. Um, so these guys are in power, uh, and by the by the mid eighties, uh, well, sorry, by 1990, which is the kind of important, the, the like key date, Rwanda is basically governed by Hutus. There's a party called the MRND, um, which stands for, some, it's, I think it's Mouvement 
pour la restauration nationale de la démocratie. It means a French. It's French. It means like the national movement for the restoration of democracy. That's the Fiji political party, um, led by a man called the juvenile Habayari Mona. And the Tutsis are largely in exile. Okay. So most Tutsis, not all, but a very large number of Tutsis, have fled Rwanda. Some to Burundi, which neighbours Rwanda to the south, some to Kenya, and many, and many to Uganda. Um, and they live in refugee camps. Okay, so there's huge numbers of Tutsis in refugee camps. Um, 1990, this force kind of comes into serious play. Okay, it's called the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And it's a Tutsi force based largely out of Rwandan, uh, Ugandan rather, refugee camps uh, located in Uganda that aims to overthrow the Hutu government, basically, and starts the civil war. The civil war drags on from 1919 to 1994. These guys are, well, it's somewhat unclear that, to the exact extent, the exact extent to which he led them. But Paul Kagame is the big name in the RPF, right? He's the, the kind of military leader of the RPF. Um, now, 1994, there's some evidence that this has been pre-planned for quite a while, okay? But, in 1994, uh, Habay Aramana's plane is shot down while he's leaving Kigali, which is the capital of, of Rwanda. The Burundian president is a man called Cyprien Ntayaramana, is also on the board. And they're killed, allegedly by the RPF, though in fact many historians now think that the plane was probably shot down by Hutu, Hutu power nationalists in order to trigger the genocide. Um, there's certainly like, a good amount of dispute there. Anyway, what happens is to some extent well known in history. So over the course of approximately 100 days, 800,000 Tutsis are massacred. One of the most notable things about the Rwandan genocide is that to a large extent, unlike other genocides in history, it's not perpetrated particularly by an organized fighting force. There are, to be sure, leaders and coordinators, but most ordinary Hutu are engaged in the genocide. Okay? Most, just like most Rwandans, and this is one of the things that's so difficult about national reconciliation in Rwanda, most Rwandans participate either as victims or perpetrators in the 1994 genocide. Um, if you refused to participate, or if you didn't actually want to be a genocide yourself, because there was an expectation on every Hutu that they would go and wipe out the Tutsi, um, then instead you had to buy the beers. That was the, you had to buy the beers at the end of the day. You had to buy beer for everyone who'd been like out genociding in your community. They would come back from a day's work killing Tutsi, and you would have to get them around. Are you joking? No, I'm not. I'm not sorry, I'm not joking. That was the expectation. If you, because everyone had to be in some way involved in the process. It was one of the most stunning examples in history of the use of kind of malleable ethnic identity. These hatreds were relatively weak up until sort of 1993, 1994. Is this all happened because the Belgians left? Uh, Rwanda, or no, so the Belgians left ages and ages, and the Belgians have been out since the 60s. So why, like, uh, it happened this year? Why, why is it just like if the Belgians left, like you said, many years ago, why it happened during the 90s? Well, in part because the RPF had started a civil war. So that's at least one of the things that destabilizes Rwanda, is that these guys had finally organized in the root refugee camps in order to invade Rwanda. Um, in part because Habayar Armana's plane was shot down, and no one really knows what caused that. And there's some considerable historical argument as to whether or not the genocide was actually planned before Habayar Armana's plane was shot down. Certainly, Media played a particularly important role in the Rwandan genocide. So there was a radio station called RTLM, which used to broadcast 
lists of names and addresses of Tutsi, and then the locations of machete caches to tell who to use where to go. There was a newspaper called Kangura that used to publish like editorials basically saying that the Tutsi needed to be wiped out and so on. How many? You said 80 days and how many people? It was about 100 days, 800,000. 800,000. It was a pretty like high efficiency genocide um, in terms of like pretty, pretty strong. Um, Most of them were murdered in the genocide. The 800,000 is the figure for the genocide. Yeah. So, when was that? 1994. And the war? 1990. So, this is the civil war. Okay. This whole thing is the civil war. And then, in 1994, there's the genocide. What's that then? Sorry? kind of running out of Tootsies, um, <laughs> relative like, I mean, but literally most, most of the Tootsies that now live in Rwanda were RPF from the refugee camps, partly the RPF won. Um, so the, RP, the, the thing that actually stopped the genocide was that the RPF, which was the Tootsie rebel force, seized Kigali and was then able to impose order. Um, and at that point Tootsies took control of the government. Um, and ever since the RPF has governed Rwanda. Even now? Yeah. So That's they've the still got the same same political problem, that they've got a minority governing a uh, majority, or is it not an issue anymore? Well, this is what I want to come on to talk about. So one of the things that's very interesting about modern Rwandan politics is that to a large extent, Kagame has been able to exploit the West's genocide guilt as a means of attracting a lot of international aid and getting very little questioning for the, the political policies he imposes. So there are basically no alternative political parties in Rwanda. Everyone votes RPF. Um, like it's actually a relatively closed off system. Uh, political enemies are persecuted. Um, Kagame assassinated a lot of his political enemies. Um, there was an RPF, his foreign minister, spoke out against him in the late 90s, in part because of what I was saying earlier about the subsequent RPF, arguably genocide of Hutus in the Eastern Congo. So the RPF go pursuing the people that perpetrated the genocide in the East of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and kill up to 300,000 ethnic Hutus. Um, man named Seth Sennashonga spoke out against that was immediately fired by Kagame and a few weeks later was killed in Nairobi by the last government on motorbikes. Um, he's a pretty unpleasant man, but he's been able to build this kind of quite ideological state, actually. There is quite a coherent kind of, sort of almost like, Kagame arguably tends to think of Rwanda as kind of like an African Singapore. He wants it to be like a highly authoritarian, super efficient, um, <laughs> economic growth miracle. And to a large extent he's succeeded. Um, that's a very, very broad brushstroke approach, but we only have about 10 minutes. Um, if you want to understand, I'm going to put up some further reading, basically, um, if you're interested in learning more about this stuff. But if you want to understand what happened in the genocide, there's an amazing book called Leave None to Tell the Story, which is actually available online. You can download it for free about like, how the genocide was perpetrated. Does anyone have any Rwanda questions? Yeah. Yeah. When you were speaking earlier about uh, agency and how, you know, how Africa is perceived, you know, like, that we don't need them, like, a lot of independence, you know, to settle down the conflict. Would that be a best example for, like, opposing uh, that, that, you know, that there was no interference of well, Rwanda is often seen as the like ultimate failure of the United Nations to intervene because there was actually a UN force on the ground that failed to prevent the genocide. It wasn't UN force. Sorry? It wasn't UN force. They didn't do anything. Well, they say they didn't do anything. There were UN troops there. That's what I mean. Yeah, sorry. Uh, after the 300,000 uh, Hutus were slaughtered, yeah. from then to now, 
What was the way Kagame treated the teachers that now live in Rwanda? Well, they don't have very much political power. The political power is all concentrated among Tutsis. And to a large extent, economic growth also primarily benefits Tutsi. There have also been allegations that he's perpetrated further genocides in refugee in Hutu refugee camps in the eastern DRC. Um, so not not great, but there's been no kind of like open sort of thing. Yeah. Would you say that Tutsi is the I know it's not the same, but uh, what happened in Sudan is like a little bit similar to what happened in Rwanda. It's like two tribes that um, kind of fight each other and, and then it got divided to south of Sudan. Not really, for reasons we'll come on to. The cases are actually very, like, the cases are actually quite radically different, but I'm going to talk about Sudan next. So, like, yeah, for various reasons, Sudan is a much more kind of evenly matched war. There's much like, like, there is no clear genocide in South Sudan. Um, Darfur is different. So Darfur is not located in South Sudan. So in as much as there's been a genocide in Sudan, it's not really been related to the ongoing civil war in the same way. Um, Bregman, did you have a question? All right, let's move on and let's talk about Kenya. So, Kenya. 2007 is the key date in Kenya because it's the year of the elections, which kind of became very violent, and so arguably made Kenya a very interesting case study for the successes and failures of African democracy. Um, the background you need about Kenya is until 2002, it was governed by a man called Daniel Arap Moy. And the West basically forced Moy out. The West required him, they made all of their aid to Kenya conditional on Moy accepting turnips. So Moy goes in 2002 and is replaced by a man called Moy Kibaki. Okay? Now, Kibaki is an interesting figure. He served under Moy, but has become a Moy opponent. Um, and in fact, defeats Moy's selected successor. It's a guy called Kenyatta in the 2002 elections. At this point, it looks like Kenya is a pretty good example, really, for African democracy. Um, the West has successfully imposed conditions on an African president who's stepped down. He's been replaced by a president from the opposite party. Um, the ruling party has given up power peacefully. It all looks like it's going pretty well. Kibaki seems broadly like he's a reformer, he's going to make the economy better. It's kind of all going good. Enter this man, Raila Odinga, who has previously served under Kibaki um, and is the leader of the main opposition party. Now, there are four big ethnic groups in Kenya. Okay? Um, they are called the Kikuyu, and Kibaki is Kikuyu, the Kalenjin, the Luo, and the Luya. Now, to give you an idea of how flexible ethnic identities are in elections in Kenya, in the 2002 election, the Luo and Kikuyu, and also the Luya, are allied together against the Kalenjin, because Moi is Kalenjin. Um, and they, these guys work together, they have a coalition in 2002, and uh, it's a big part of what causes the fall of, the fall of Kibaki. But, by 2007, we now see that the Kalenjin have largely sided with Kibaki, and Luo have largely abandoned their allegiance to him. <coughs> Odinga is Luo. Um, the basic sort of thought about this is that elections become kind of zero sum in this environment because these groups are all of roughly equal size. The Luo are like a little bit smaller. But broadly speaking, you'll just about win an election if you get an alliance of any two of these three. 
but only just, right? It'd be very, it'd be a very, very slim margin. Um, and in fact, if any of them vote the other way, then your alliance is destabilised. What happens in 2007 in what are largely expected to be free and fair elections is basically that Kibaki steals the election. So Kibaki, there's like flagrant uh, ballot box stuffing. Kibaki intimidates the electoral commission into not announcing the results and not announcing the results until eventually the results are announced in favour of Kibaki. Predictably, there's enormous amounts of violence surrounding the election and in the immediate aftermath as a dingo tries to seize power. And at various points, like Kenya watches, at this point I'm kind of like baffled as to what has happened, because it's all really gone to shit quite quickly in about five years. Like from standout economic performer on the African continent to on the brink of civil war, and most people think isn't gonna last more than another year without a catastrophic ethnic conflict. There is a lot of violence, very large, fairly large number of people die, and then, Kibaki and Odinga reach a power sharing deal under which Kibaki remains as president but Odinga becomes his prime minister. Um, and they also agree to construct a new constitution that guarantees formal rights for ethnic minorities and also to a much greater extent devolves control of politics to the local level. That constitution was ratified last year in a popular referendum. Um, and now, albeit somewhat uneasily, Kibaki and Odinga have a power sharing deal, and it's relatively effective. Kenya is governed quite well, they both have various cabinet ministers, conflict has not yet broken out again, um, various senior figures who were involved in the 2007 violence are now being prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. Um, there's two on each side. Now what this example was kind of intended to illustrate is whereas Rwanda might make it look like ethnic conflict is at times unavoidable when you're kind of steeped in an ugly history, often that's not really true. It is possible to successfully manage ethnic tension in Africa in order to get a working democratic process and that's pretty much exactly what's happened in Kenya. Um, and the constitution also massively increases the importance of ethnic politics, and so on. Has anyone got any questions about Kenya? Is it um, still like that? Is it still yeah. corroborate together? Yeah, there's still power sharing. When is the kind of next election? It's, it's delayed by the new constitution. What are the predictions as to the outcome of it's what I mean, it's not widely thought that a dingo will certainly like undisputably win. And do they reckon that the power of sharing is going to go on or is this going to take the same No, no, the power sharing is intended to last until the next election. Yeah. Instead of only going it's possible to win an election by scraping together an alliance two ethnic groups. Yeah. Uh, and only just scraping groups. So, so why do you think that Odinga is the sort of front runner? runaway winner of the next election. Well, in part because the importance of these ethnic identities is massively broken down right. after the electoral violence in 2007. In part because it's not at all clear that the Kalenjin will stay with Kibaki, right? Remember what I said earlier, that previously Kiku and Luyo were allied against Kalenjin. There's no principal reason that you couldn't get a Luo-Kalenjin alliance against the Kiku. Awesome. Let's talk about Sudan. This is the last case study. No more genocide? Well, there'll be a bit of genocide in this one because it's like in passing. There's a genocide which is like a little bit tangential. Right, that's a map of Sudan. Which is the capital. This this bit is South Sudan. 
So first common misconception to clear up about Sudan. Darfur is not in the south. The Darfur conflict and the independence of South Sudan are basically totally independent from each other. Indeed, the very ugly civil war between the north and south, which lasts for a very long time, is arguably concluded in 2002 with what's called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the year before the genocide in Darfur really gets going, um, which is in 2003. So, Darfur and the South are like basically separate questions. Um, there are arguably some related impacts. In particular, Darfur and the South don't share any tech. Like, there's no route from the South to Darfur. Um, that doesn't go through the North. So, background. Um, Omar al-Bashir, it's a very nasty man, seizes power in a coup. Can you write the name? He actually sees his power along with a man named Hassan al Turabi, who's a radical fundamentalist Islamist. He's very closely associated with Osama bin Laden. And in the late 90s, when Turabi was still around, um, bin Laden hung out a lot in Sudan. Didn't he help them out with uh, Turabi's invitation? Um, there, is, <clears throat> there are some theories to that effect, but the evidence is like relatively unclear. Um, we know who was there, and we know that there were Al-Qaeda training bases there, so it's likely that they were like in some way. Yeah. <coughs> so, there is a 21-year civil war that runs from 1981 to 2002 in Sudan, and is brought to an end. Um, now, Again, to emphasise the importance of fluid, the fluidity of ethnicity and the way that ethnicity is very complex in, in Sudan. While there is like an argument for saying that the North are broadly Arab, and they are Arab Muslims, and the South are African, like black African Christians, and that is, that is true. So if you're resident in the North, like it's, it's a country jammed together by bad colonial design, basically. Um, there are also two big ethnic groups in the south, one called the Nur and one called D the Dinka. And they are historically like massive, massive enemies. The Nur and the Dinka fucking hate each other. Um, fight all the time. For at least for the duration of the civil G problem, which made drawing this border very, very difficult. Um, and as many of you will know. Um, on June 6th, 2000, you never get Independence Day exactly right. Isn't that South Sudan? Yeah, South Sudan becomes independent. Um, 2006? So, it was... 2000, it was like three years ago? Before no, it was in 2011. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but very recently, South Sudan has become independent. Now, this was intended to basically solve the problems to a large extent with, with the North-South Civil War. So the North-South Civil War ends with a peace deal called the CPA, which gives the South an option of a referendum on secession, um, which they take with like 94% of the vote in a referendum in 2008, I think it was. Um, anyway, they all vote to secede, they secede. Um, now, has it worked? Well, Arguably, but there's still an ongoing border conflict here. In particular, there's a very oil-rich region called Abayi, and no one can really decide who Abayi should belong to. So that's a massive problem. There's a lot of fighting over that. There's also a massive problem that the SPLA has now kind of split into factions, that a lot of the Nur versus Dinka tribal conflict has been reignited. They're like killing each other again. There's a lot of violence in South Sudan. And also, South Sudan was now free of northern control and controlling quite a bit of oil, has basically all of the things that are worst for a state trying to become successful. It's landlocked, which is typically very bad for states because it makes it very hard for them to trade if their neighbors are unstable. Um, 
It's exceptionally poor. It's like one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, a girl in South, a 14 year old girl in South Sudan has more chance, has a greater chance of dying in childbirth than she does being in school. Um, so this really is when I said please don't think about Africa as like just a basket case where everybody has AIDS and dying. South Sudan is like about the closest you get to somewhere that's properly screwed. Uh, although no AIDS, very little AIDS, it's not really an issue there. So that's a plus. Um, <laughs> And also, it's still being attacked by the North. And to a large extent, the North controls a lot of its trade routes, it still controls a lot of its oil, and it's only got one political force. One of the problems of having a liberatory movement that frees you from your oppressor is that they're the only po political game in town. So it's not clear who's really going to create the meaningful opposition to the SPLA that gets their policies challenged. Does anybody have any Sudan-based questions? Are the South, the South people are also Muslims? No, they're, uh, they're Christian. What exactly happened during these years? That was the civil war. So there's oh, a civil war between the South. This is how long South. it was? Yeah, 21 years. What does the SPLA stand for? Sudan People's Liberation Army. It's the Southern Army. Why do we believe that um, Al Bashir let South Sudan go relatively peacefully instead of giving up the war again? Um, I mean, he's kicked off the war quite a bit over oil rich regions. Um, partly, it's not like having a long war was particularly good for the North. Um, the SPLA also started to scare Bashir a bit in elections because they kept winning an inconveniently large proportion of the vote. And in particular, a lot of northerners started voting for the SPLA because Bashir is a pretty bad, pretty oppressive man. Um, so arguably it cements his control over the north. I mean, I also think there's like a non-zero chance that if South Sudan had seceded totally lawfully and with the north's arguable consent and then he'd invaded the international community and destroyed him. So... What happens does the north happen? Well, it's got a lot less oil than it used to because a lot of the oil is located in the south. Um, it only has one political force. Uh, its president can't go to most foreign countries because he's wanted for war crimes by the International Criminal Court. Um, massive refugee problems because a lot of your uh, northern Arab that lived in the south, you've had to move north of the border. Um, so there's huge internal displacement issues. Like, it's less badly off than the South, but not by a lot. But if the South has the oil, are they just not utilising it properly at the moment, or are they still, are things still being blown up there? So part of the problem is that the peace deal still mandates a, a, a certain amount of revenue sharing between the North and the South, because otherwise the North wouldn't have been able to let the South go. Part of it is, like, extracting oil is quite difficult, and you need political stability to get international companies to come in and extract your oil for you. Like, oil, it's, it's very it capital intensive. Yeah, I mean, they're there, they're trying, but not, in, not perhaps in the quantities that they should be. And also, where do you pipe it out? You can only, like, you can only pipe it out through the north if you want to get it out of the country. Or you have to go through alternative and also relatively unstable neighbours. Speculative question. You, no, you, yeah. you have researched Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. And do you, can you offer or speculate what, if any, the Western world can do in order to improve the current set of events in the south of Sudan? I... Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, get the oil flowing is a pretty big thing. Um, if international companies get involved, that will probably require a large amount of assistance from the international community. They're probably also going to need aid to do things like building schools. Like, it really is a pretty screwed up country. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's a very, very big question. Like, all of the things we try and do in post-conflict states, which are very weak. Um, but I don't really know. I mean, I kind of, there's, there's just so much stuff that we can do 
like trying to make sure that it doesn't turn violent again. I'm not really quite sure why I understand what the question is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that matter, do you believe uh, is your I have, if, your, if your question is, is it going like, to be screwed up in the future? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Assuming that our experience in trying to dissolve uh, problems in many can conflict countries in Africa usually fail. We believe we have a moral justification to continue trying due to the fact that it usually fucks up. Saying that it, it usually, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily true to say that it usually fucks up. I think often we don't hear about the interventions that succeed as much as the ones that fail in part because there are fewer consequences. So, like, French intervention in the Ivory Coast, for instance, recently was very, very effective. It got Kabagbo out. He's now awaiting trial in The Hague. Um, you know, it got the democratically elected winner of those elections in, and it prevented the Ivory Coast lapsing back into civil war. And there's a very successful British mission to end the conflict in Sierra Leone. Um, South Africa and the AU's behest to be incredibly effectively in Angola in the early 2000s. There are lots of examples of successful interventions, you just don't necessarily hear about them. I'd say we definitely have a moral obligation to make our interventions better, but that's not quite the same thing. Yeah. Can you briefly outline like, the African Union? What does it do? Okay, so the African Union is basically all of the countries in Africa in a European Union style federation, though much less extensive. It's the principal things it does are there's a move towards economic cooperation. So there's a move towards reducing trade tariffs, which are a massive issue in Africa. Um, in one particular thing, that if it is able to do this, will actually I think make a massive difference is the creation of an African single currency. Uh, which they've unfortunately provisionally dubbed the Afro. Um, <laughs> but, um, but they do want to create an African central bank that would issue the Afro. Uh, which, which would be as successful as the Eurozone? Well, but, I, mean, compare, I mean, obviously you have to compare it to African currencies at the moment, which are just absurdly volatile. And to the extent it's very, very difficult to ever invest in many African countries because of currency volatility. Um, but how would that not make the whole thing not volatile, like in the EU? Well, I don't think it necessarily, for, like, because it's, the, the comparison is different, right? You're not trading off against, like... But you have some countries with incredibly high inflation rates, like absolutely crazy high inflation rates in countries who are relatively... Sure, safe. but a large part of the reason for that is very poor central banking, which is one of the things that an African central bank is intended to correct. Um, but they're taking a module that has worked in a relatively more stable environment but and that's, somewhere that's even less stable. But that's exactly the reason that I think it's more likely to be comparatively successful. As in, Europe didn't have enormous currency stability problems before the creation of the euro. It was intended as like a relatively small game. Whereas for Africa, the creation of any kind of currency stability would be a massive deal. Um, similarly, getting any central bank credibility at all would be an amazing win for the African continent. Um, so yeah, uh, the creation of the Afro, the, the enormous thing that it does, which is actually relatively significant, is that uh, if there's a military coup in your country, you'll be immediately expelled from the African Union which also means the trade sanctions and diplomatic sanctions are placed on you. And that's proven relatively effective at getting coup leaders to hold democratic elections fairly quickly. What, what is right. coup? Oh, when the military yeah. takes over. Oh, okay. okay. Other Africa questions? Awesome. Uh, in which case, I think we're done. Thanks very much.